Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Catalytically Upgrading Biochemically Derived BDO from Lignocellulosic Biomass to Advanced Biofuels and Chemical Co-Products. Our speakers today are Derek Varden from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Zheng Long Li from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and Vanessa Daigle from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. By default, you are listening in using your computer speaker system. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane of your control panel, and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the question pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Now I'll turn it over to Derek. Great, thank you for the introduction. And it's my um, pleasure to introduce a talk today. Uh, looking at the technology options we're pursuing within the ChemCap Bio Consortium, for upgrading biologically derived 2,3-butane dial um, from lignocellulosic biomass to advanced biofuels and chemicals. Uh, the talk today will be a tag team talk with myself, Zheng Long Li from Oak Ridge National Lab and Vanessa Daigle from Pacific Northwestern National Lab. And we'll be giving you an overview of the ChemCab Bio Consortia and what we're doing within the project. So our work in upgrading butane dial to fuels and chemicals is really part of a multi-lab effort that we refer to as the Catalytic Upgrading of Biochemical Intermediates, or CUBI for short. Within the project of CUBI, we're looking at a variety of routes for how to upgrade both biomass-derived sugars, as well as related intermediates into hydrocarbon fuels and co-products. Within this effort, we're looking at several pathways, um, particularly furfural and HMF as a chemical route, um, for upgrading sugars to C10 and C20 paraffins, as well as biological routes that utilize sugars and convert them with microorganisms into a variety of intermediates, including alcohols, aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids, and diols, with today's talk focusing on routes with 2,3-butane diol. The chemistries we pursue include a variety of carbon coupling and hydrodeoxygenation steps, um, to allow us to systematically work with similar feedstocks um, starting from lignocellulosic biomass and converting them into transportation fuels and biochemical products. The overall CUBI effort is really a collaborative effort amongst the four national labs, including Los Alamos National Lab. Um, and today we'll just be highlighting our work on butane dye. The motivation for us looking at biochemically derived intermediates uh, ties a lot back to feedstock. Biochemical conversion processes are adept at handling agricultural residues and herbaceous energy crops, which can be produced in very high volumes, over 500 million dry tons per year, estimated by 2040. Within this route, it's a more selective low temperature process where biomass comes in for pretreatment. It undergoes enzymatic hydrolysis to allow for the um, sugars to be produced and lignin to be removed that can then go valorization by a variety of routes that are being explored within the DOE portfolio. Our work within CUBI is highlighted within the dash box where we explore both direct catalytic conversion pathways for the sugar and sugar intermediates, as well as the biological conversion product intermediates as I mentioned earlier. And so this talk today will focus on one intermediate 2,3-butane dial, which we've been um, producing from a biological route using corn stover hydrolysate here at Enron. The advantages of us looking at 2,3-butane dial is it can be produced with microorganisms at high titer due to its low toxicity. With 160 liter pilot fermentations, we've been able to demonstrate over 87 grams per liter with very low byproduct formation. It can also be recovered in high yields from distillate, and there are many co-product opportunities that we'll highlight in today's talk, including methyl ethyl ketone and butane uh, butadiene. 
The three talks today will highlight the various pathways, including a one-step direct production of butadiene that I'll be highlighting in the following slides. Also, work going on at Oak Ridge National Lab looking at zeolite derived processes for producing C4 olefins and jet fuel precursors, as well as routes via methyl vinyl carbonyl and methyl ethyl ketone um, being pursued at Pacific Northwest Lab, uh, where those can then be upgraded to both butadiene or directly for olefins for fuel precursors. So that now leads me into highlighting our first research short story on the single step conversion of 2,3-butane dial to 1,3-butadiene. Butadiene is a large and growing market within the U.S., and this product can be used for a wide variety of applications. Our work on 2,3-butane dial upgrading involves both process research and development, where we're looking to identify requirements for catalyst composition, reaction process conditions, as well as feed purity specifications coming from fermentation products. We also are exploring the foundational science questions related to understanding the reaction mechanism of these catalytic transformations, what the rate limiting steps are, and trying to describe the catalyst active site and its properties that govern the behavior that we see from a process standpoint. Our work at NREL has focused on developing a cesium phosphate catalyst supported on commercial silica that has been shown to produce it's very high yields of butadiene from a one-step process of when upgrading 2,3-butane dial in the gas phase. Over 87% yields can be obtained at uh, greater than 90% conversion over select process conditions. We've been doing significant catalyst development with both industrially and commercially available silica supports that can have a wide range of surface areas, um, and we're looking to tailor the cesium and phosphate loadings um, to optimize the, both the butadiene yields as well as their overall productivity to inform our techno-economic process model. In collaboration with the Consortium for Computational Physics and Chemistry, we're also looking at some of the underlying mechanisms governing the one-step production of butadiene from 2,3-butane diol. We've been able, um, with collaboration with Sona Kim and Robert Patton, to identify epoxide as a key reaction intermediate that governs the selective transformation to high yield butadiene. With experimental validation, under low conversion conditions, we've been able to identify the predicted epoxide intermediate within our reaction products, and then conduct experiments where we can then feed this epoxide intermediate directly over our catalytic system and demonstrate that it results in the high yielding butadiene product we see over both the cesium phosphate and phosphate catalyst, helping to confirm some of the uh, mechanistic requirements and active site requirements for this chemistry. Based on our understanding of the requirements for the catalyst active site, we're also looking at employing catalyst cost modeling tools developed within the ChemCap Bio Consortium, particularly the catalyst cost model, to estimate the price of these more novel catalyst materials. We're able to look at the price of raw materials, particularly the cesium and phosphate precursors, as well as conventional and novel high surface area silica materials that can help us estimate some of the trade-offs when altering the metal loading and surface area of the underlying material. With this material cost information, we then can um, provide this information to our techno-economic analysis team to highlight the trade-offs of increased material costs with catalyst productivity and lifetime. Certainly, catalyst stability is also a major concern of ours, and so we've been exploring the impact of water, both on the reaction product yields, as well as the underlying catalyst material stability. When producing butadiene as a product, coking of the catalyst is also a concern, and so we've been exploring strategies to extend catalyst lifetime through feeding co-feeding steam, but also trying to understand how that may impact the regenerability of the catalyst support, and whether or not we have concerns over loss of surface area, and support restructuring, and how we can apply emerging research materials to help address these deactivation challenges. When transitioning now from model compound studies to fermentation-derived butane dial using lignocellulosic biomass, we're also working closely with upstream biologists 
separations teams, and analytical chemists to understand the unique impurities, both organic and inorganic, that are present in these fermentation-derived products, particularly the presence of acetic acid and acetoin, as well as inorganic species that can foul the catalyst and deactivate it over time, are high on our list of compounds to identify. Certainly, residual moisture and water content is a major process challenge, and so we're working to understand the impact of these non-target compounds and carryover products on how they impact catalyst performance and how we can use that information to inform upstream separation and fermentation teams to holistically integrate process design for developing both fuels and chemicals from renewable butane dial. Our work to date on the single step process has been able to help us show that, at least with preliminary reactions, we can achieve fairly equivalent yields between model and biologically derived butane dial. And further work is looking to examine the long-term impact of these impurities on both product yields and underlying catalyst material stability. And so, in short, I hope I've given you a nice overview of our ongoing work looking at single-step conversion route over cesium phosphate catalysts for producing 1,3-butadiene, and how we've been able to collaborate with the cross-cutting efforts in the computation, uh, consortium from computational physics and chemistry to better understand the reaction mechanisms over these unique active sites and how impurities may impact the performance and how we're using that to inform the overall economic and sustainability analysis. And with that, it's my pleasure to turn it over now to Zhang Long Li at Oak Ridge National Lab, who can discuss another active research pathway we're pursuing within the Cubby project for upgrading 2,3-butane dial. All right, thank you, Derek. So I'm going to shift the gear a little bit uh, to talk about 2,3-butane uh, dial to distillate fields, mainly targeting heavy-duty diesel and aviation biofuels, along with other co-product opportunity. And so for this specific pathway, we're looking at converting 2,3-butane dial uh, in one step to making a mixed olefins. And this mixed olefins can be taken further to make diesel and jet range hydrocarbons. So this pathway offers advantages like we can have a high selective, high selective production of these mixed olefins, and which can result in high distillate yield. Meanwhile, we're able to produce co-products like methyl ethyl ketone as an industrial solvent or fuel additive. So for our catalysis focus, really is on the first step. And there are different uh, reaction steps you can take to convert 2,3-butane dial to olefins. In this case, I highlight a few reaction steps we can take for one-step conversion, this cascade reactions. Basically, you can take 2,3-butane dial, do dehydration, and making this primary product. In this case, we're focused on methyl ethyl ketone on this type of catalyst. And also further converted that to make uh, to butenes. And butene can be further take down to other olefins like propene and pentanes, where olefinization and cracking reactions. And on the other side, butene can be further converted to aromatics, which as a precursor to form coke. And I want to mention this is all cascade reactions within one step. So there's some earlier work group work published in 2015, basically use, utilize copper or microporous ZSN5 to do one step conversion to making butenes and other olefins in a good uh, yield. And we see there's still a lot of room that we can design new catalysts and also improve the process, try to optimize the mixed olefin selectivity. Meanwhile, also try to enhance the catalyst stability, especially address the Coke formation issue. So metaporous zeolite has been proposed as a very good material to address Coke formation. And in our study, we take the 2D PLMFI as a support, and we load uh, copper onto this type of support. And one of the reasons we take this material, because it has been reported in the literature, to be able to dramatically reduce the diffusion uh, uh, length inside the micropore, as indicated here in this cartoon. And with the hypothesis that using this kind of 2D PLMFI, we're able to reduce the co-formation 
and also minimize the tertiary cracking product. For example, propene, pentens. Especially propene, the downstream olomerization is less reactive compared to the butene olomerization. So we take that as a support and synthesize copper pillar, pillar MFI using ammonia evaporation, evaporation method. And this catalyst has been analyzed by different techniques by collaborating with advanced catalyst synthesis and characterizations within chemical bio. And here, I'm showing you this as synthesized catalyst after calcination, especially for the copper, primarily exists as a copper oxide nanoparticle based on this analysis of the stem at Oak Ridge National Lab. And this catalyst is further uh, protruded under hydrogen reduction condition. And most of the copper is able to convert it to metallic copper as indicated by the in-situ extra absorption done at Argonne National Lab. And so this re reduction condition is the same as we use uh, during most of our reactions. So we propose this is the metallic copper is the active site for our reaction. And we're further validating that in, with the operando analysis in our future work. And we take this catalyst and we, we evaluate that under different reaction conditions, try to maximize the total all of this. And here I'm showing you both the temperature effect and also the hydrogen video, video effect on the product's activity. So in this figure here, basically, as we increase the temperature above 250 degrees C, we're able to maximize the total olefin uh, formation, which goes above 90% selectivity. As we decrease the temperature, you can see the total olefin goes down. Meanwhile, the methyl ethyl ketone increasing. And this really gives a very good knob that we can tune the ratio between the co-product and the final olefin pr product. And the other one we, we, we can we show here is the hydrogen video ratio, especially when that ratio is below 15. We're able to vary the composition of these olefins. And that gives us the opportunity to tune the final fuel composition by changing this hydrogen video ratio. We also evaluated this catalyst under 250 degrees C to understand the catalyst stability. Here, I'm showing you, this is the conversion of 2-3 video. And basically, within 90 hours, we're able to maintain the stability. However, we see there slightly decrease of the total olefin formation, which is suggesting there, there's some mild deactivation happening there. And this deactivation can be reversed by direct calcination under air, and mainly due to coke formation. And we Further compare this 2D pillar MFI catalyst with this microporous ZSM5 catalyst to validate initial hypothesis on minimize the downstream cracking product and also addressing the coke formation issue. So in this figure here, I'm showing you on the y-axis is a cracking product and butene ratio. So as, as we hypothesize at the beginning, so the 2D PMFI there has the potential to minimize the cracking product, which is validated here. And also for the microporous ZSM5, it's deactivated much faster compared to the 2D PMF5, which is further validated by the larger model of coke formation on the microporous ZSM5, suggesting the 2D PMF5 has the benefit to address the coke formation. And we also take this catalyst to test it, the fermentation drive 2,3 BDO, which we obtained the fermentation broth from Enrel. And this is showing the composition of the fermentation broth, and along with uh, some other impurities. And we did vacuum distillation to recover the 2,3 BDO and also some other organic co products. And here, I'm showing you comparing the fermentation derived BDO and also commercial, derived, commercial BDO. Basically, we found that the impurity impact on this has on this catalyst has a really minimum impact there. And we're of course, this is only for a short time time on stream. We're going to focus on a longer term study and also looking at other impurity impacts in the long term 
especially the video obtained from different sufficient technologies. And we further take this mixed elephant from the first step and go through the automerization and hydrogenation step to making diesel and jet range hydrocarbons. Here, I'm showing you one sample that we obtained from this pathway. And we distillate this sample and recover the jet range hydrocarbons and also did some preliminary field testing analysis. And basically, for most of the critical parameters, they're meeting jet A properties. And for these jet, jet range fractions, it's primarily isoprophenic hydrocarbons, and which is a very good uh, hydrocarbon that can be used to blend into the petroleum-derived gel. And this fraction also has a wide hydrocarbon distribution from C8 to C16. Include a significant amount of all carbon number because of we're feeding in a mix all of them. Also from the whole process perspective, we're able to recover a significant amount of carbon into the final fuels and co-product with the jet range hydrocarbon being the dominating fraction there. And of course, this is just showing one example. We have the experiments here able to tune the hydrocarbon distributions and also the model of hydrocarbon in the final product there, as I mentioned earlier. So TE has been used as a very important tool to guiding our research and also to assess the project progress. And in this case, I'd like to highlight the TA work that done at Enrio. Basically, in this flowchart here, showing the case step there, take biomass and wear biological approach and then catalytic upgrading approach to making hydrocarbon fuels. And there are a few examples I'd like to highlight it. Based on this TA prediction, there are several key areas that identified for the future of catalysis work. One being divert two, three video to making value added co product to enable to meet the $3 per GDE target. And also reduce two, three bidding dial upgrading temperature, especially for liquid phase upgrading. And also improve catalyst stability against impurities to reduce the load of separation. With that, I'd like to hand over to Vanessa. Thank you, Jiang Long. As an alternative um, to the single-step processes, we are also um, investigating two-step approaches uh, for the upgrading of uh, BDO. I cannot switch slides. All right, thank you. We, are, we have been uh, developing a two-step approach for the uh, upgrading of uh, BDO to um, C4, C5 olefin, going through metal ethyl ketone intermediate. Um, for this approach, um, we are using an aqueous feedstock, aqueous BDO, and the reason for that is um, that um, the BDO fermentation broths are highly diluted in water, and the separation of uh, BDO from water can be challenging. Until now, we have been using a non-zeolite catalyst that we think are less sensitive to water. And um, unlike the single step process, I will show you later that um, we do not necessarily need to use hydrogen to make this C4, uh, C5 olefin from butane diol. So let's focus on the first step now, the BDO grating to MEK. Um, the zeolite catalysts have been shown to be very active. Um, under mild conditions, you can get a full conversion with high selectivity to the desired MEK and a selectivity of about 10 to 20 percent of the isobutyral byproduct. Our goal here was to um, identify catalysts that would provide similar, if not improved, uh, catalytic performance as compared to the zeolite. So you can see from uh, the figure with this program um, that we have tested several catalysts. And the uh, mixed oxide MTO catalyst distinguishes itself from the other ones, since not only we can get high conversion under mild condition, but also um, the selectivity to the um, undesired LBA is only 3%, which means we get about 95% selectivity to the desired product including 82% selectivity to, to MEK. 
An advantage of the two-step process is that we get opportunities for uh, co-product diversification. Um, and more specifically, with this MTO catalyst, we can make um, a reasonable quantity of uh, C4 alcohol. Um, and among them um, is uh, isobutanol, um, for which uh, the market is pretty high, as you can see. So the message here is that uh, we have been able to identify a mix oxide catalyst that is highly efficient to make um, desired products, including NEK from uh, butendiol. So now, now let's focus on the second step, which is MEK conversion to uh, C4 olefin. Uh, we have developed a zinc zirconia catalyst uh, with unique properties um, to produce um, olefin from MEK. Um, when we feed um, aqueous MEK over the zinc zirconia catalyst and under nitrogen, at 78% conversion, we get a reasonable amount of olefin, about 58%. And again, it's under nitrogen. When we replace nitrogen with hydrogen, you can see that both conversion and selectivity increase. We get 92% conversion and 85% selectivity to olefin. So under hydrogen, we get higher carbon efficiency uh, as compared to when we use nitrogen, um, as you can see. Um, The product distribution is different depending on whether we operate under hydrogen or nitrogen. Uh, under nitrogen, we make mainly 2-metal 1-butene and 2-metal uh, 2-butene. And under hydrogen, in addition to this olefin, we also make a mixture of 1-butene uh, and 2-butene. Uh, so the important thing uh, to remember here is that the zinc zirconia catalyst uh, enables the production of uh, C4, C5 olefin in one single step from MEK, and this can be done with or without hydrogen. For the, for the second step of this process, uh, we were interested in understanding the effect um, of um, the MEK dilution in water on the catalytic performance. And the reason for that is that for the first step, BDO to MEK, Depending on how we operate, we can either have the MEK going to the liquid phase, which is highly diluted in water, or the MEK going to the uh, gas phase, which would be similar to uh, pure MEK. Um, so as you can see from this figure, um, the feed uh, or the MEK dilution in water has a pretty huge impact on, on the conversion and the selectivity, since conversion and selectivity increases with the concentration of MEK in water and the best results were obtained with uh, pure MEK. We wanted to um, understand the impact of uh, the feed composition on the stability. Um, so as you can see, when we operate with the aqueous MEK as a feed, uh, the conversion is pretty stable. But when we operate with pure MEK, the conversion decreases uh, pretty quickly. So we have characterized these two catalysts, the two spent catalysts um, through SCSC. For those who are not familiar with SCSC, it's a project within CATCAN Bio that does catalyst synthesis and characterization, and they are very well equipped with a characterization tool. So what SCSC found is that when we operate with pure MEK, we make a lot of coke in the form of uh, carbon graphite. The good news is uh, we can regenerate the catalyst by simple uh, treatment under air. So the bottom line here is that higher concentration of MEK in the feed is preferred to obtain higher uh, yield towards the desired olefin, but water helps prevent uh, deactivation due to cooking. So just to summarize very quickly here, uh, we have developed a two-step process for making small olefin to BDO. Uh, we get high um, carbon yield. And uh, we also get a uh, high quality fuel um, as uh, suggested by the seam dist and uh, freezing point. So now I'm going to discuss um, about uh, the production of butadiene from BDO via MVC. We have developed a process that goes through metal vinyl carbinol, MVC. Um, the second step of the process is quantitative. So we are focusing on the first step, BDO to MVC. And for this, we are using uh, pure BDO as a feedstock. 
The indium oxide catalyst was uh, chosen among about 40 catalysts because of its high performance and its high selectivity to the desired MVC. And for this catalyst, we have uh, done some uh, stability profile presented here. So you can see that the catalyst deactivates uh, with time. Um, but after uh, simple regeneration, uh, the, the, the activity is completely restored. Um, and the bonus to that is that the regeneration actually improves uh, its uh, longevity. Um, it seems like the, the regeneration uh, opens up new site, a new active site. We determine the effect of the temperature on um, the catalytic performance. Um, and as you can see, when we operate at lower temperature, um, the conversion is uh, quite the same. But um, there is a difference in terms of uh, the MVC selectivity in blue. When we operate uh, at lower temperature, the selectivity to the desired MVC is higher. Uh, we were able to obtain about 70% selectivity to MVC at about 90% uh, of conversion. And as you can see, um, the catalyst deactivates, but it doesn't really deactivate that fast as compared to a number of other catalysts that have been tested for this reaction. We were interested in understanding the effect of steaming on the catalytic performance. So what we did here, um, we ran under our baseline condition. Then, instead of doing a regeneration, we did a steaming treatment under air. And then we started the reaction again. And as you can see, after the steaming, um, the activity and the selectivity appear to be uh, closer to a steady state. Um, which might suggest that the steam could open up or uh, regenerate new site, or regenerate site. Interestingly, this indium oxide catalyst um, has a very low surface area but, um, for uh, its high performance. So we decided to um, try to improve the surface area of the catalyst with the idea of improving uh, further the catalytic performance. We developed a second generation catalyst um, as you can see, the first generation catalyst has a surface area of 8 km per gram, and the second generation catalyst has a surface area which is uh, one uh, order of magnitude higher, uh, and around 100 km per gram. When we compare um, the catalyst under the same conversion, about 90%, the selectivity to the desired MVC increases from about 50% um, to the 60%. So the second generation uh, catalyst uh, uh, seems to improve uh, the selectivity to MVC. We just uh, uh, discovered this catalyst and uh, we need to do further testing, but the results are, are promising. So just to summarize quickly here, we developed a two-step process uh, for producing butadiene uh, from BDO uh, that allows high carbon efficiency. And the catalyst uh, longevity has been demonstrated for more than 100 hours. And now I'm going to turn it over to Derek. Terrific. Well, thank um, you both, Zeng Long and Vanessa, for um, sharing those research uh, talks. And so just in summary, I hope for the ChemCab BioCubby project, we've been able to highlight several routes um, for looking at ways to upgrade 23 butane dial into both hydrocarbon fuels and co-products. Um, through this approach, uh, we have been benefiting from a collaborative effort that has been allowed us to share both process materials, particularly the fermentation broth, as well as having an integrated techno-economic uh, approach to evaluate uh, the developments with each of these conversion pathways. Uh, as far as accomplishments go, um, we've been glad to highlight the enabling projects and how they've helped with the advanced catalyst material characterization, uh, understand the catalyst cost modeling, as well as the insights computational chemistry can provide with regards to the reaction mechanism. And certainly the various routes that have been highlighted between NREL, Oak Ridge National Lab, and PNNL hopefully give you guys a flavor of the different chemical options, pathway options available for upgrading 2,3-butane dial. With regarding um, relevance, uh, a lot of these products are trying to address the technology and commercialization barriers associated with transitioning from clean sugars to lignocellulose-derived feedstocks. And future work will uh, continue to evaluate the impact of these non-target impurities and inhibitors and look to further develop um, catalyst materials that can handle the 
uh, impurities, high moisture content, and inform upstream separation processes as well. And so with that, uh, certainly uh, I would like to acknowledge the Department of Energy and the Bioenergy Technologies Office for sponsoring this work, particularly Nicole Fitzgerald and Jeremy Leong for their support, as well as the collaboration with the Consortium for Computational Physics and Chemistry, or the CCPC for short. Uh, regarding the researchers, as mentioned, this is a strong team effort with members from all of the different national labs highlighted today. Uh, so certainly this presentation wouldn't be possible without their support and contribution. And so with that, I'd certainly like to thank the speakers today, and we'd be glad to answer any questions the audience may have regarding these three research efforts. Okay, our first question says, will the water be more problematic during bio-BDO dehydration in batch system instead of continuous reactor? And I think to answer this question, since this is a, um, a webinar, we can uh, cycle through the uh, speakers today. So at least from, um, the presentations that we've seen and, and the work um, going out of the additional, different national labs, uh, a lot of the process and catalyst development is conducted under continuous process conditions, uh, particularly for the butane dial products. So at least for the work going on with NREL, we have, um, because the gas-based chemistry has not evaluated uh, condensed phase batch reactions, but I'll uh, certainly hear the perspective from Zeng Long and Vanessa as well. Thank you, Terry. Uh, so basically, also for our current pathway that I just showed today, it's primarily also on the gas phase conversion. And we're in the progress of working on liquid phase upgrading. And I would expect there might be some impact if you kind of work with different type of reactor there. But that's something we need to further evaluate in the, in the future work. Yeah, I think Zenglong summarized uh, very well what we what we are planning to do. Uh, we are currently working in gas phase, but we are very interested in uh, looking in the future in the the working liquid phase and see how uh, water will impact uh, the catalytic performance. Great, thank you. Our next question asks: Any impact from the types of feedstocks, for example, Constover versus Miscanthus? Um, so that's a, a great question on the impact of feedstock and the impurities. Uh, particularly for the butane dial project, um, this past year is when we began the most exciting results on the upstream fermentation process, where they've been um, today solely focusing as corn stover as the feedstock of interest. Um, with new developments on the strain engineering to help lower the production of non-target organics, um, specifically ethanol. Uh, because of the recent development with that strain, um, we've only been able to test it with corn silver feedstock, uh, but certainly the impact of other biomass-based impurities and how those carry over into the separation train, as well as into the downstream chemical catalysis, is a key question that I think our consortium is well positioned to answer. Um, we just haven't, uh, the project hasn't gone along far enough to address uh, feedstock-dependent impurities um, but that is a great uh, question of, uh, to bring up. Thank you. Our next question asks, is it a big concern that the produced C3, C6 olefins could be over -olig oligomerized to form polymers over the applied catalyst? Yeah, we... We have not observed any polymerization so far. When we do the oligomerization, we have done oligomerization for hundreds of hours, and this hasn't been a, a problem so far. Yeah, so also for our system here, uh, basically, uh, we, we haven't observed like anything above like C3, 
22. So basically, we're in the fuel range, basically jet and diesel range. You you can manage uh, by op by by modifying your operating condition. You can manage to be under the C20 uh, and avoid polymerization. So this is not a, an, an issue here. Yeah. Great, thank you. Our next question asks, why the H2 is an important effect during 2,3 BDO conversion? Is hydrogenation of double bonds critical to the cascade process? So yeah, this is journal here again. So for our technology there, so basically if you look at one well, of the slide I show there, so if you produce, you know, one well, of the uh, intermediate of the primary products like methyl ethyl ketone or other aldehyde there, you need the hydrogen to convert that to alcohol in order to further producing the olefins. Um, I can add to that, um, in, for the two-step process, uh, we do not necessarily need to use hydrogen for the second step because the catalyst is a zinc zirconia um, solid solution, and this solid solution uh, pro presents redox properties that allow us uh, doing the hydrogenation um, without uh, the, the need for a metal and for hydrogen. Thank you. Our next question asks, is sugar used for 1,3-butadiene products? Hmm. Uh, that's a great question as far as um, how far this technology has gotten as far as impact in the market. Um, to date, at least from the butane dial pathway, there we've only seen work in the peer review literature by uh, research institutions and universities on taking um, butane dial to this product the uh, uh, one-step and two-step pathways as we highlighted in the work today. At least to my knowledge, um, we have not seen the um, commercialization of 1,3-butadiene produced from uh, butane dial yet as a um, actual market product. But I'll certainly be glad to hear um, the technology and commercialization perspectives as well as Zeng Long and Vanessa. No, as far as far Derek, I haven't seen uh, anything going to commercialization yet. Yeah, I also didn't see any um, basic uh, news or something on that. And most of the work has been in the literature space, and also in some of the area like when we build the in other work. There's only very limited reported literature work. Some work has been done from from Laser Tech, where they've been able to do some uh, pilot scale demonstrations. So. And then, as a follow up um, question from the same uh, commenter, the specific also got into are C5 or C6 sugars used for butadiene production? And that is where I'd say um, we have the most exciting results on coming from NREL on the upstream processing, where they can actually use um, both the C5 and C6 fraction of the hydrolysate without solid separation to do the fermentation of butane dial um, with the very high um, titers we've seen, the 87 grams per liter. And so certainly when that's uh, applied into the techno-economic process models, the ability to use both the C5 and C6 sugars without solid separations our major reason why it's a promising route, at least from a preliminary technology cost estimate standpoint. So um, really great question from the audience on that one. So it looks like we have time for one more question.
Okay, our last question is, why the self-aldol condensation did not cause the C to C gro chain growth for MEK over the zinc zirconium oxide catalyst? Can you please repeat the question? There's something about um, aldol condensation. Yes, uh, I believe the the audience member asked them, why does self aldol condensation not cause chain growth for MEK um, when passed over the zinc zirconium oxide catalyst? Okay, so let me give you a little bit of detail regarding the, the chemistry here. Um, so what happened is that um, as, as yeah, MEK is going through aldol condensation, uh, going to this um, C5 and uh, and um, so the C5 olefin, uh, as well as some propanaldehyde um, that is converted into pentanol. Um, the, the C5 are, are not being oligomerized uh, because we don't have the, the acidity that is required to go through, through this step. Uh, there is not, uh, you need a stronger acid side uh, to go through uh, oligomerization of the C5. To the, of the C5. I hope I answered the question correctly. Thank you. Uh, that is all the time we have uh, to answer questions today. Uh, that ends our webinar, Catalytically Upgrading Biochemically Derived BDO from Lignocellulosic Biomass to Advanced Biofuels and Chemical Co-Products. You will receive a follow-up email within the next couple weeks with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. Thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day.